Thank you for joining us online today. Here at the House of the Lord, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if you have a testimony that you'd like to share with us, please email amen at hotl.church. If this house has impacted you anyway, and you'd like to partner with us financially, please visit our website, hotl.church, and click on the top right to give. Or you can text the dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the message. Have a great day. This is entitled uh, this morning, uh, So You're Dead, What's Next? <laughs> okay. Spent a lot of time praying on that title. But we started um, last week, uh, we've been doing our Let's Talk About Fill in the Blank series, and we, we last week it was Let's Talk About Heaven. And how many of you were here just maybe really enjoyed that? Yeah. Uh, lots of thoughts and provoking and I had lots of questions and and so what I what we did was I said let's let's take some questions this week and then uh, we will just address some of the questions that people have uh, it, it sometimes it's really difficult because uh, there's a mystery to it you know like for example um, I've never been to Israel you know as a pastor sometime I'd like to go but I, I so I can I, I can read about Israel and I can even see pictures of Israel. But I've talked to people that have actually put boots on the ground over there and they say it's totally different. Yeah. Well, heaven is like that. We see a picture of it in Scripture, and we understand there's eternity in our hearts, and yet at the same time there's a mystery. But we need to talk about it in. Genesis 28, verses 10 through 12, it said, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place, put it under his head, and lay down in that place. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Um, Dr. David Jeremiah wrote this. He said, heaven is not a figment of imagination. It's not a feeling or an emotion. It's not the beautiful isle of somewhere. It's a prepared place for prepared people. Mm. I thought that was really, really, um, really insightful. Uh, let me just open with a word of prayer before we, we move on. Jesus, I thank You so much for Your Word and for Your Spirit. I thank You for Your people. I thank You that your word says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. I thank you that we're still learning and we're still uh, we're aware of so many things uh, because of your word and because of your spirit. But as we just continue to um, search this out and see what your, your word says, then God, we just pray that it, it's a blessing and encouragement uh, to our hearts. Help us to communicate. Um, we, we love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. They all said amen. amen. So I'm going to just, just a couple thoughts, and then uh, Pastor Joel's got a couple thoughts. And, and then we're going to get into some of the questions that were submitted. Y'all ready for this? And you know, you got, here, here's the deal. You got like two preachers on the stage. So you might want to hang up, you know, hang on a little bit and, and see, how that, see how that works. And especially if you know Pastor Joel. Uh, he's a he's a super conversationalist, and and what I did was I actually strategically gave him all the hard questions, you know, uh, you know he's really smart and he studies this kind of stuff, and usually you get a history lesson when he preaches because that's kind of his DNA. But so the message last week was about heaven. What will it be like? What will, will what will we be like? And whether you are in denial or not, we all have a shelf life on this earth. Right. Come on, I mean, think about that. We've got a shelf life. If you ever went to the grocery store and you see something that's good, tell, and then there's a date, and then you're kind of like, okay, I think I'm good with the date. I'm going to take a little bit of a risk. Right? But listen, you don't want to take a risk because the Bible says there's an appointed time for every man. Appointed time to live and appointed time to die. And, and we don't want to take a risk with that, but we realize that there's this shelf life that we have on this earth and that heaven is in us. We've been created for eternity. 
And, and there's within everyone, I believe, this kind of this, this supernatural DNA. It's an instinct. It's a belief. And it's why every person searches for something. Mm. And they're searching for that, that fellowship with, with Jesus, with God. And it's why somebody that's still 80 feels like 30 in their mind. Mm. Can I get an amen? Because yeah. you know, your spirit never grows old. Right. Because you've been created... For eternity, there's over 600 references in the Bible to heaven. And heaven is all about Jesus. And when we do die here, we're not leaving this home, but we're going home. Right. We're, we're, we're not leaving this home, we're actually going home. Uh, Benjamin Wichkoti um, said this, Entrance into heaven is not at the hour of death, but at the moment of conversion. I love that, man. That's just like entrance into heaven is not at the hour of death, but at the moment of conversion. And I love this as it establishes this link between heaven and earth. And in the Lord's Prayer, we're taught to pray, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the more that I studied and the more that I uh, understood about heaven, the more that I wanted to make sure people were, were there. And yet there is this mystery. There's this, this mystery. And I also understand that if God wants me to pray in a certain way, that also God, I was also called a partner. I was also called a partner and I'm empowered in this link between heaven and earth and that I can also experience the resources of heaven to help me on this earth. Think about this. A citizen, uh, how many of you have been to a foreign country? Okay. Uh, But you're a, a U.S. citizen. A citizen has rights and resources even when they're in a different country. Right. And, and, and actually, I am a citizen of eternity and I have rights and resources that just because I'm in another country, I don't give those up. And I think that's really important. Amen? Yeah. Pastor Joel, take it away. Okay. That was abrupt. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to stand if you don't mind. I, I, anyway, I'm just going to stand. So uh, I want to I want to go first to uh, to Second Corinthians uh, verse or excuse me chapter four verses sixteen to eighteen and says so we do not lose heart though our outer self is wasting away our inner self is being renewed day by day for this listen to this for this light momentary affliction is preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension or comparison excuse me as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Um, one of the things that, you know, as Pastor Jeff was preaching last week, uh, I, really, I really felt strongly in my, in my mm. heart to, uh, to remind the church of today is that part of the reason uh, that it's really, it's really important to have a proper perspective on heaven, the resurrection, the renewal of all things, like part of the reason why it's really important is because if we don't have that, then our whole framework for our relationship with Jesus is about this really narrow scope of like, what, 80 years? I think the average average American male lives 76 years. The average American female lives 78. You know, I mean, it's just... The problem is is that if we we don't keep our eyes on on the real purpose, we tend to sell out for what's here and now. Like, let me put it to you this way. Um, the, The average age of retirement is, I think, about 63 or 64. So if we were to take if we were to take the average number of years that a person actually survives past the average retirement, most of us are spending a huge part of our adult lives going like looking in one direction, nine years between retirement and death. Our whole resources, a lot of our thought, almost everything is given towards what happens when I retire. Am I going to be set up to have a good life at the end there? Can I remind you of something? I, I, gotta, I gotta say something else. How many of you know that life isn't fair? Mm. right like when was can I just ask you like introspectively ask yourself when did you realize life was unfair at what age did you you looked around there was somebody that was taller than you there was somebody that was smarter than you there was somebody that was wealthier than you like there was an age where you realized we don't all get the same thing this is unfair can I tell you that 10,000 years from now, you're not going to care that life wasn't fair for a short blip of time. 
See, so, so many of us, we're so focused on, on trying to right perceived wrongs or dealing with it that we forget part of what Paul was talking about. He said these momentary light afflictions. Right. Paul was writing, to, was writing to a church that was, in, in, in our estimation, was being deeply persecuted. What did he say to it? It was light. It's really not that big of a deal if you think about it in the scope of eternity. Anybody in here remember when you scraped your knee the first time? Why? Because the moment it happened, it was the worst thing that had ever happened to you. But in the light of the scope of your entire existence, it's actually not that big of a deal. You don't remember the pain, even though your, your three- or four-year-old self was just like, ah! <laughs> I can't do it. I, I can't rep- replicate it. <laughs> Part of the reason it's really important to have that perspective of not just where you are, but where you're going. Yeah is that you plan differently. You know, Pastor Jeff was talking about it last week. He said, he said you know, where, where, whatever your destination is, that will change your preparation. If you're going to hike Mount Everest, what are you going to do? You're going to prepare a lot differently than if you're just going for a walk down the street. Can I be honest with you? I don't think a lot of Christians are preparing for heaven at all. And we're just not. Like, how many of you in the room recognize that there is a reward system in heaven? We don't all get the same thing. The parable of the towns, I will say this, Jesus didn't talk a ton about what it would look like in the next life. He was a lot more concerned about getting you there than he was telling you what you were going to find there. But he's actually pretty clear. If you look at the parable of the talents and you look at the story of the, of the master and his servants, it's really an interesting thing. What he says is, you know, I'm paraphrasing both of these and kind of mashing them together as they like mashed potatoes because, you know, we're getting close to Thanksgiving. But in essence, what he says is he says, you know, there was, a, there was a man, and he had three servants, and he was going on a journey, and he comes to each one of them, and he gives them certain talents, a measure of something. Now, whether that was actually talents of money, which a talent, by the way, was about 10000 uh, it would have been be about $10,000, um, but whether, whether that was money or whether we, we, we look at it spiritually like he was giving them gifts, what he does is he says, I'm giving you these things, and then I'm going to return to see what you've done with them. So to the one, he gives five talents. This guy goes out, he hustles, he does his thing, he makes five into ten. Then another guy had three, he turns three into six. Another guy, another guy has one, and maybe he was, he was a little bit too tripped up about the fact that it was really unfair that he got one, and he was going to be judged on you know, percentage-wise, but whatever it was, he does nothing with it. He's afraid of the master, he's not sure what's really going on here, so he buries it. So the master comes back and says, what? What did you do with what I gave you? How did, you, how did you prepare for my return? To the one guy that gave, and this is really interesting, I've talked about this before, but the promotion system of heaven is so different than ours. See, to the one guy that turned five into ten, instead of giving him money, he gave him influence. He said, well done, good and faithful servant, because you have turned your five into ten, I'll make you now the master of ten cities. I, I want to take a second and, and say that right there, I think that that should actually start shaping what our, our, our understanding of the next life is going to be. There's so many people that their perspective is, oh, we're going to, you know, uh, so I don't know, like uh, worship eternally, which, you know, some guys, you know, some, well, and honestly, probably everybody to a certain degree, you have such a hard time with the, with the idea of doing nothing or worshiping that that doesn't actually sound great to you. Like you don't think to yourself, I am going to really enjoy singing the same 85 million songs for the rest of my life, which is forever. Um, I, I want to give you a different framework. He says, now that you've taken these meeker, these, these talents that I've given you, you've turned them into something else. Now your reward is going to be influence. If there aren't going to be societies in heaven, if there's not going to be places of, places of authority, why would he even make that, that, that particular analogy, that, 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 that parable? You're going to be doing something in heaven. Does that make sense? What you do here determines what you'll do there forever. That's absolutely right. What you're doing now will determine what your place of authority is. See, even when Jesus says it, and this this is me wrapping up, when Jesus says it this way, he says, I go back to my Father, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That word place isn't room. Sometimes we, we, in our minds, for whatever reason, we've translated that as a mansion. Um, I, maybe you'll have a mansion, but that's not what that word means. That, that word place and the word room, those two words actually mean place of authority, not mansion on a hill. He's going to prepare a place for you of authority. You were created to work. You're going to be working forever. Now, un, you know, maybe unlike what you do now, you're actually going to enjoy that work. So that's good. That's good. You're going to enjoy it. 
But uh, that's where I'll stop. I'll stop there, and we'll get into the questions. I can keep going, though, man. I can keep going. That was really good. I, I just heard recently... I just heard recently there's a reward system in heaven, right? That's good. I like it. Are you going to sit down now? Yeah, I'll sit down. Okay, okay, cool. I didn't know we could stand up. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're actually that's good. Chair. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, let's get into this. Okay, so first question that we got. Do people in heaven now know what is going on in the earth, especially with family? Do they pray for us? Do they miss us? Okay. I believe that Scripture points out yes to some extent. In Revelation 6, 9-11, through this is kind of a, a heavy passage right here, but it says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And it was given to each one of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So you see in that passage of Scripture that there, there is this relationship between heaven and earth. And there's a, there's a knowing there's a, there's, a, there's a partnership and an, and an understanding. And then, of course, we most of us are familiar with Hebrews 12.1, where it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, uh, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. So I, I believe that we, we, that we won't know everything, but I believe that people do. They, they, they have an understanding just based on a couple. And there's actually more passages of Scripture. you have anything you want to add to that? No, that's good. Okay. You disagree with that? No. You're good. Okay, cool. All right. Awesome. Okay, so number two, when one believes early on and then walks in a different way, does the Lord take that into account? Pastor Joel, take it away. Um, so this, this question sounds like it's more about eternal security. Um, and, uh, and what I would say is that we're, gosh, no, uh, the, the, the context of, um, like a Calvinism versus Arminianism, uh, which is Calvinism is just really in total basic nutshell, uh, once saved, always saved. Arminianism is stay holy or else. Um, I, I tend to land somewhere in the middle. Um, but I really believe that, uh, God is really, really, really serious about free will. Like very, very serious about allowing you, uh, allowing you to make your own choice. Uh, you know, I, I recently answered a question that uh, somebody shot in on my podcast that, uh, you know, wh why, do, um, why does God allow bad things to happen, not just to good people, but to his own people? And, and to that I answered, God is just really serious about free will. Like he's so serious about it that he will allow you to make nearly any choice you want to make, no matter who it hurts, because he knows that someday you're going to stand before him and be judged. Um, so no, I, I don't believe that the Lord takes into account, uh, you know, if someone believed a long time ago and then they purposefully walked away. I think especially in the book of Hebrews, you find that um, God is pretty serious about the, 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 tr the choice and the decision you make. If you decide you don't want to walk with him, he will honor that. Like, maybe just put this a different way, because I think a lot of people look at God as though he's, you know, because he, he's willing to take that into account over you. Like, can I just remind you that walking with the Lord, is, it's difficult, but it's not. Like, I mean, it's difficult in the sense that, um, that, that thing, the things that our culture values, we don't really value the same way. And the things that God wants, those are the things that we highly value. But the truth is, when you make a decision to walk with God, it's actually not that difficult. Um, but beyond that... Um, I, 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 I really just have to say, yeah, um, if you've decided to walk away from the Lord, he'll honor that with every consequence that, you know, that, that follows there, thereby. Does that make sense? What do you think? I think that's right on. Next question is, will we see our pets in heaven? Seriously. I was actually preaching in uh, a church in Great Falls, Montana, and they had this um, format where you would preach and then people could text you questions afterwards and you know so you're on the spot 
And that was actually, that's actually a question that comes up quite a bit. I mean, it's kind of, kind of crazy. So uh, I thought about asking one of, one of our elders here, Brian Dawkins, as a veterinarian, and having him come up and answer the question. <laughs> but I think I already know what the answer is, and so I didn't want to put that on him. So will we see our pets in heaven? Nothing in the Bible says that pets will go to doggy heaven. Or cats, especially cats. Yeah. I'm sure cats, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, it's all good, but it's God and the devil. Dogs. animals, yes, animals were part of the original creation. And uh, in Genesis, it says God made, in Genesis 1.25, it says God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And so I'm thinking if God's original you know, creative purpose was to actually also create animals, which he did, then why would eternity be different? And then you see the picture of Noah's ark in the flood that the ark was made to ensure that animals would be part of that, you know, uh, post-flood experience. There's actually three different chapters uh, in Isaiah that refer to animals on the new earth. In Isaiah 11, Verses 6 through 9, it says, Then the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also, the cow and the bear will graze, and their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So I think that just as heaven will allow for us to create new relationships, there will be interactions with animals. And, you know, and I've had guys, you know, I wonder if they'll be hunting in heaven. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, I think the Lord might allow us to like, you know, airsoft or paintball. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm trying to call that big six point bull in man so I can hit him with that paintball and then I can have a conversation with him. Got you today. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, tomorrow's a new day. You know, I, I mean, we, you know, a lot of times we, our imagination is, is, is kind of amazing. But even in Romans 8 19, because this is kind of a thought provoking to me, it says, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And I'm thinking, you know, creation, you remember I, I started out by saying there's, there's heaven in each one of us. I mean, there's that expectation, there's that belief, there's that instinct, there's that DNA, whatever you want to identify it. And then when I look at this, and for the anxious longing, even creation longs for something. Even creation understands that what we're walking through is out of order. It's out of order. And the, and the, the, the joy and the, and the expectation is like, man, will it be amazing? Will it be amazing at some point in time to walk, to have relationships you know, with the Lord and with each other that it's all in right order? I mean, just think about that. You don't have to think about what did that person mean when they said that to me? You know, what was that look on that? What was their agenda? You know, what was their motive? I mean, the motives will be pure. Everything will be. And it, to, to me, it's just amazing because there's something that, that we long for that. Amen? Amen. All right, number four. Will our sins be read out loud for everyone to hear? <laughs> Pastor Joel. <laughs> Okay. You know, actually, uh, when I read this question, I, I asked to address this. Um, because when I was, when I was growing up, uh, anybody ever, like, you ever, like, have somebody hand you or, like, you picked up somewhere, like, one of those old, like, gospel tracts? You know what I'm talking about? That people use when they don't actually want to talk to you about Jesus. They just want you to find it somewhere, and that's a really spiritual thing to do. Anyway, um, so I found this gospel track one time, and it was, it was called This Is Your Life. And what it was, was it was basically this, you know, it was like a comic book type, type track. 
in which a man lived his whole life and then he goes to, he, he goes to heaven, or I should rather say he goes to the seat of judgment. And, uh, and then the Lord, you know, the Lord basically, in, you know, in the, in the context of everyone that's there, and there's like, you know, millions of, or whatever, and, and the Lord reveals every sin in this person's life. And the thing was, is that the, the, the track, as I read it, it actually, it actually put a, a certain fear, not a fear of God in me, but a fear of, uh, um, of embarrassment. And it actually caused me to not really desire heaven because what this track was talking about was that Christian or unchristian, you know, saved or unsaved, there's going to be a moment in which God reveals every sin, everything that you've ever done in front of everyone. That's not in the Bible, by the way. Those kinds of, those kinds of fear-based evangelism, that doesn't work. Or even if it does work, it actually produces fearful people. We don't come to Jesus because we're afraid of punishment. We come to him because we need him. I, di- I didn't come to the Lord because I was necessarily so sinful. I came to him because I recognized that everything that I had been doing was not working. Like, I needed Jesus because everything else that I was trying to fit into that space wasn't doing it for me. It was producing terrible things in my life. Um, what we see in the book of Revelation is we actually see two different judgment seats. There's a judgment seat that's called the judgment of the Lamb, and then there's a seat called the great white throne judgment. Christians don't receive the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is where man, mankind comes before the Lord and they're judged according to their works. And of course, we realize that no one is sinless. In fact, most people, to be perfectly honest with you, are far worse than we know. Because, I mean, how many of you, I mean, is is there anybody out there that like you just like air out like all the time, the the things you think about, the bad things that you've done, like you just love talking about that stuff? Oh, nobody. Oh, okay, interesting. Everybody's like that to a certain degree. The the point I'm making is Christians don't receive the great white throne judgment. We're We're not judged according to our sin. Jesus was already judged according to our sin. Does that make sense? See, he already did it all for us. And now when we come into a relationship with him, when we repent of our sins, the Lord actually says that I cast your sins away from me as far as the east is from the west. So God's just going to like, and he actually the Bible calls it the sea of forgetfulness. So is he going to like go swimming into the sea of forgetfulness to pull all that stuff back out so he can embarrass you right before you walk into the kingdom? No. We receive what's known as the judgment of the lamb. The judgment of the lamb is a judgment on your works. It's for your reward. So basically... Your judgment before God isn't about what you, what you did morally or immorally. Your judgment before God is based upon what are you going to walk into? What are you receiving here? Does that make sense? So no, your, your sins are not going to be you know, read aloud you know, in an endless litany in front of millions of people. Anything else, Dan? Amen. I mean, is anybody thankful for that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know about uh, you, but... <laughs> okay, number, uh, the next question, is there a period of sleep when we die, or are we immediately alive with Christ? Soul sleep is a teaching that uh, the soul sleeps unaware um, after death until the resurrection day, and it comes primarily from a couple of verses in... Ecclesiastes, it comes from Ecclesiastes 9.5 and Ecclesiastes 12.7. However, I, I don't believe that the New Testament supports uh, this doctrine, and we need to use the New Testament as a lens uh, for viewing such. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse, uh, 5, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul writes, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And at the Mount of Transfiguration, we see Jesus meeting uh, Moses and Elijah. And both had died on earth and were certainly conscious at that point in time, as well as the thief on the cross, where Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. also seems to intimate that the believer who dies on earth will be in the presence of God and waiting for the day of resurrection and the resurrected body. And if you remember last week, what we taught, what I taught was 
that the heaven that we refer to today, uh, most scholars would say it's an intermediate heaven because the Bible says that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And so that, that, that's kind of how we, we frame this. Once again, there's, there's, with all of this stuff, when you, when you get into doctrine and theology, one of the things you have to keep in mind too is that there's really good people, smart people on both sides that can really make a great case for one right. way or the other. So there still is a mystery. But from my perspective, this is what I see uh, in Scripture. And I, don't, and I don't see the doctrine of what would be called soul sleep. Actually, that, that doctrine would be, I believe, uh, Mormonism and, and Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, maybe Adventists believe that too. Just some, some different varying uh, you know, views. But that's not what, what I see Scripture revealing. Okay, the next one. Do good people go to heaven even though they were not religious? Do good people go to heaven even though they were not religious? Pastor Joel. <laughs> he is gonna, really going to weigh in on we're this We're going to talk though. about marriage yeah. and heaven and whether there's marriage and sex in heaven too. And Pastor Joel's going to address oh, that yes. subject. <laughs> um, I mean... Sometimes, sometimes there, there are things in, in the Bible that are really nuanced. Um, there are things that are, well, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll put it this way. I think there are a lot of times that Christians want to make like black and white blanket statements when, you know, like we really want it to be a black and white world, but typically there's a lot more gray areas than there are black and white areas. Um, I don't think this is one of them, though. Uh, there, there is a, I'm just going to say it, Pastor Jeff kind of asked me not to, but I'm not going to get too deep into it. There is kind of a, a general um, theological perspective out there called open theism, you know, that, uh, that basically, you know, it really does depend on the conscience of the person. Like if they thought they were doing good things and they were doing bad things, it's some, that they're, they're judged in that way. Um, I, don't, I don't really think that's the case. Um, the Bible is pretty clear that... Um, that eternity belongs to Jesus, like that, that his reward for us, you know, is, is, is eternal life. And so I, I got to say, I mean, again, this is, this is one of those questions that it's, it's easy to say this, but it's, it can be very difficult to hear it. And, and, and it can be very difficult also to kind of like, to, to really get it into your heart and your spirit that, you know, that maybe your, your great grandma was, a, was a wonderful person and she cooked great pies, but if she didn't know Jesus, she's not there with him. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I think that what we struggle with is that we do see uh, varying degrees of good and varying yeah. degrees of evil. But even Jesus, when he was asked, he was, he was called good teacher, said there's not one good, not, you know, not, not him. Mm -hmm. And, and the Bible says, for all have sinned. Right. For all have sinned. And so that really means that there is a need for every person to have a Savior. And I do believe this. I believe that every person has the opportunity. Uh, I heard old time pastors, preachers, a number of them would tell me, you know, that in their experience in their life, they would feel they, they have recognized that God will move on a person strongly three at least three times in their lifetime just drawing them right. jesus i mean as jesus said this he said you did not choose me i chose you yeah. but then the response is we have to accept that calling and, and 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 respond to that and that's a really difficult thing because we do we see people that we deem are good yeah. but yet at the same time um sin is is there there's going to be no sin in heaven and it, it really illustrates that we, we, just, we just need the Savior, no matter what degree of that. I, I love the analogy uh, that uh, we had uh, uh, Scott McNamara come in uh, a few months ago, and he's just a major evangelist. And he would simply say, hey, you know, he'd talk to anybody, and he'd say, hey, you know, if your sin was in a backpack and that you were carrying, would it be heavy or would it be light? And some people might say, well, it's, you know, pretty light. He said, well, it's, it's still a weight, isn't it? And they would say yes. They said, "Well, then you need somebody. You need you need a savior." So that's a that's a really hard question because it deals with people that we love, and I know that there's uh, uh, I, there, there's people that 
in that moment, I don't know what that moment is between life and death. I mean, this is my hope. Uh, because I've had a lot of people I love that I know have passed, and I've never heard them profess Christ. I'm just, my prayer is that somewhere in, in that in that step between life and death, there was some sort of a visitation and they had a chance to say, hey, I want to receive you as Lord and Savior. But remember, we all have a shelf life. Don't let it get to that point. Right. You know, I mean, just, 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 you know, just, just respond. So that's a, that's a hard question, but that's a great question as well. I just don't think we, I don't think we take it for granted. And, yeah. and a lot of times, uh, if, if we're not careful, we base our evangelism and our willingness to reach out to people based on, on how they look. Oh, they look like they're doing fine. They right. probably don't need yeah. Jesus. You know, but then you see the, the, the person that's just down and out and there's just been destruction and collateral damage. They're like, man, you need Jesus. They all need Jesus. Yeah. We all need Jesus. Yeah. Um, uh, just one more thing to add, because I know that there's, you know, another question that, that typically comes up when we talk about this is like, what about people who've not, who've never heard about Jesus? Um, I think that one of the things to consider is that uh, Jesus partners with us in the, in the ministry of the gospel far more than we give him credit for. Um, for example, there's this, there, there's a book I read a number of years ago called Eternity in Their Hearts. And it was about this this guy, and he was a um, he was a, a mission a missional what was he called it? like a missional historian, and uh, basically he he had heard stories about these you know Aboriginal tribes and you know in various places so there was a few of them in South America, um, and some over in over in Asia and just a bunch of different places that they were they were worshiping Jesus they just didn't know what his name was. So he went to their, he went to these villages, and he was he was looking at what their worship practices were, and he found that um, he found that there were there were crosses involved, there was uh, there was communion involved. Like basically, Jesus had taught these people how to worship him. Um, you know, additionally, right now, I mean, uh, one of the greatest revivals in history is happening in I Iran, of, of all places. In right, fact, that the right. University of Tehran mm -hmm. um, had less than I think it was less than one percent, or you know, less than 500 people that were that were Christian 10 years ago. But today, there's more than 50,000 students and leaders in the University of Tehran that are saved. And the reason why is not because you know they've got Billy Graham over there or something like that. It's because Jesus has been showing up in people's dreams. Right, right. I think that I think that part of part of our issue sometimes when we address this question is we forget that just because you didn't say something to someone doesn't mean Jesus didn't speak to him. Right. And that, that's that's not an excuse to not evangelize. We're, you know, rather we should you know we should be doing you know like I was talking about earlier, like what 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 is your destination and what are you preparing for? Like what was what was Jesus' last command before he you know went to prepare a place for us? Be like him in the earth, right? And so I think a lot of times that's, that, that's something that we're missing. It's a hole in our gospel. We, we like the idea that we're saved, but we're not as, not as keen on really actually getting other people saved. Yeah, amen. That was really good, Joel. I like that. Uh, by the way, what, um, one of the things that, that Joel has been doing that's been really powerful is a podcast. You do that podcast like every couple of weeks? It's every week. Yeah. Okay, how do people find that podcast? If they, you know, if you're the average Joe out there that doesn't know where that is. Um, well, I mean, if you, if you, if you have a, a smartphone, uh, my podcast is on um, Apple, Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Play, it's on uh, Spotify. It's called uh, Faith Simplified. Faith Simplified, very good, recommended. Okay, last question. No, actually, second to the last question. Would we live in the New Jerusalem? If yes, what's outside of it that we would want to leave and go outside of the city? So Joel and I are both going to uh, attempt to answer that question. Once again, there's a mystery. But there's a guy named Jim Henry. I want to give him credit for doing the math. There's people that just do these studies, right? And they... They put stuff together, and it was pretty fascinating what he did. So basically, you take the dimensions given in the book of Revelation. And I've actually seen pictures of it. That they, you know, they, 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 take a, they take a 3D drawing of the earth, and then they would put the dimensions of what the New Jerusalem looks like. And it would be this big, huge cube you know, setting on the earth. So it's, it's kind of fascinating. I've never really considered that. But basically, the dimensions given, it's 1,500 miles given in the terms of a square. So that means it's 1,500 miles high, it's 1,500 miles wide, it's 1,500 miles long. That means it would stretch the New Jerusalem, according to 
this mathematician, would stretch from Maine to Florida to get a little bit in context. And that means that if every story were 15 feet high, it would be 528,000 stories high. Think about this. That means on every floor there would be 2,250,000 square miles. Now my head starts blowing up right here, y'all. Just saying. All the stories would constitute, and I don't even know what that number would be. 1.18 trillion? 1.18 trillion thousand square, I mean billions and billions and billions. You know what I'm saying? Seriously. And it means that according to the Department of Eugenics from Carnegie Institute, this is what grabbed me, there's been 30 billion people who have lived on the face of the earth since time began. And if every one of them were going to heaven, every person in that place would have 39 and three-fifths of a mile, of miles, square miles to live by, by themselves. That's pretty crazy. That's amazing. That's amazing. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. We have no idea. You got any thoughts? Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Are you Sorry, paying attention to me? I was mesmerized by on, the numbers, Okay, man. okay, all right. No, actually, what it was is it was, you started doing math, and I was just like... <laughs> 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 um, I, I think one of the things to consider uh, about the book of Revelation is how much of it is, uh, yeah. is, is prophetic allegorical language. Yeah. Um, and, and so, on one hand... Um, well, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't discount the fact that you know that it's very, very possible that like God can do whatever He wants, really. Um, but I think one of the things to consider is is what was the original intent of all civilization? What was what was the Garden of Eden meant to be? If if we if we can kind of grab at least hold of the fact that that's how it was supposed to be, it stands to reason that that's a, a, sort of how it will be. Uh, and I don't mean that necessarily like you're all going to like walk around like nude in your, you know, in your glorified bodies. But um, I think sometimes when we're, when we're thinking about heaven and Pastor Jeff hit it earlier, of course, but um, the church has tended to have a, a pretty bad dualistic theology of heaven. Like we assume that we were made for heaven and that when we die, that's where we're going to be forever. That's actually not what the Bible teaches at all. Um, that when Jesus returns for the second time, he's going to remake the earth for us. So I guess my, my, my thought there would be, I don't think that Jesus is making one city. I think he's making one massive nation. And I really do think that, 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 the, that the New Jerusalem will probably present itself as the capital of that nation, but I don't think it's going to be limited to, that, to, to the one city. That would be my thought. Okay, so finally, we're just going to wrap it up. Um, there's a new heaven and there's a new earth ahead and God desires that you and I be part of it in the present journey in the present journey we prepare for the destination I mean I don't know about you but that 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 probably that that thought has kind of transformed even some of my thinking even over the last few weeks as I've just been praying and studying because for every destination that you go to, there's a different preparation. So what is our preparation? You know, what is, what is our preparation? Uh, you know, in Hebrews it says that God is a rewarder of those who, who seek Him. And, and Pastor Joel did a great job of just breaking down the parable of Jesus and the stewarding the talents. And so, what do we, how does it motivate us? I know for me, it, it doesn't motivate me to just hang on. Hang on. It motivates me to say that everything that God has created and desired, He's created with people in mind. And that He, he wants this because it's a present journey as well. You know, this is what I love. When, you know, the story about Jacob where he saw the ladder and he saw angels descending and ascending. 
And there was this amazing just interaction between heaven and earth. And we see it. And that was thousands of years before our time. And he sees this vision. And I believe that what it should motivate us to do, because you can't preach heaven without the reality of hell. And recognizing that there's a heart of God that none should perish, but all have everlasting life. And so I, I think for me, the motivation would be, I believe we're called on earth to walk with Jesus, to experience the fullness of life that He has for us, but to partner with Him. And I believe the heart of God is to empty hell and fill heaven. And I believe that's what we're to do. So I want to just, I want to just encourage you this morning, um, if you haven't done that, Put your faith and trust in Him. Realizing, you know, the you know, Bible says that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would hear me and open the door. And I love that illustration of Jesus at the door of your heart. But the only handle is on the inside. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul writes that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died, that He was raised up again on the third day, you profess and confess Him with your mouth and with your heart. That's a step unto salvation. 